So unfortunately, if you're studying research methods with me, you're going to have to learn a little bit of Greek philosophy. I'm very sorry about this, except I'm not really, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about three terms from Aristotle, uh, which are episteme, techne, and phronesis. And they're here represented by the brain, the hammer, and the owl. Um, so Aristotle develops the theory of this. Uh, and generally, we still use the Greek names because we don't really have good translations into English of these three concepts. So when that happens, I think it's always better to just retain the original name and, and explain it, define it, rather than try to fake a word for it. Um, so episteme is pure knowledge, right? It, we've been talking about epistemology. This is where the word epistemology comes from, right? It is the pure knowledge of the world, right? We might also say scientific knowledge if we're working from when, within the kind of contemporary paradigm of what science is. Um, the next one is techne, and techne is applied knowledge, the knowledge of how to do something. That so I frequently say that um, teaching research methods is techne, right? Most of what I'm teaching you is how to do something. Well, I'm also teaching you some other things too, right? But there's not a lot of episteme that you need to know in order to know how to do research, right? Most of what you need to know is techne. Um, and obviously this gives us technical and technique, right? So that can kind of help your understanding. So phrenesis, we don't have many words that use this root in English. Um, and it's usually translated as practical wisdom or judgment, right? It's not the knowledge of how to do something or what something is, but of what to do, right? And it's usually highly contextual knowledge, right? Um, sometimes people just say wisdom, right? To mean phrenesis. And so the reason why we're even talking about this, this tripartite division of knowledge from Greek is that um, Bent Fleurberg, that's how I was learned, learned to pronounce his name. Somebody who speaks Danish better than me, please correct me. Um, he researches, he's a public admin scholar. If he were at U Ottawa, that's where he'd be located. And he studies things like mega projects, right? Big dams and things like that. And in response to some of the chaos of the methods debate at the late, at the end of the 19th, uh, 20th, or beginning of the 21st century, he, uh, he writes a book called Making Social Science Matter. In it, he argues that what social science should do is produce phrenesis, right? We should generate frenetic knowledge. And the reason why is that episteme is not terribly useful, right? But the social sciences are lo you know, located deeply in human interactions, right? And what people actually want to know in those scenarios is what to do right? Not how something happens, not why something happens, not even necessarily what to do to make something happen, right? But what they should do. So, you know, you're in a situation where you're like, okay, um, let's say I want to restart the economy during a pandemic, right? Should I remove gathering limits and the ability of people to go inside stores and restaurants or should I um, spend a lot of money that my government doesn't necessarily have because tax revenues are down in order to subsidize people doing not that, right? Um, which should I do, right? And obviously governments in Ontario and governments in Canada and the world as a whole have taken different paths, right? They've, they've answered that question differently. And phrenesis, is the wisdom that allows us to answer that question, right? Um, and so if we were doing good social science, we would be able to give good advice. And so think of Ontario's public health table, right? Um, who is saying, here is what you should be doing, right? That's phrenesis, right? Um, and then what happens after that is politics. Everything is politics, but that's definitely politics, right? So this is what Floberg is getting at, right? And it's worth pointing out, he's a public admin scholar, which means he's really interested in what people do, right? Um, he's not an abstract political scientist thinking about, but how does the world work? No, he's like, how do governments actually run the thing, right? Very fundamental to what he's doing. 
And so part of the move Fluberg is making is that he's distinguishing between the natural sciences and the social sciences because the social sciences are social, right? People, people everywhere, systems everywhere, right? Episteme is great, but doesn't necessarily answer people's questions is the point he's making, right? The natural sciences are episteme and when they want to get applied, they're techne, right? But they've got nothing upon nothing to say about what is there to be done, right? That's just not useful in the social science context, right? Phrenesis looks at these normative questions, right? And says, we have to actually make decisions between actually existing realistic things, right? We are not in this abstract world of let's define a perfect government system. No, we are here in a room with a thing. What do we do, right? That's what phrenesis can do. And that's something that is distinct from what the natural sciences do, right? So he's not interested in the unity of science approach, right? Which we've mentioned before in our conversations is something that's in positivism and positivist approaches to knowledge, right? Um, and so if we're trying to map phrenesis onto the paradigms that I've introduced, if you haven't watched my paradigms lecture, you can go back and watch it, right? Um, the epistemological and ontological commitments of phrenesis are basically similar to critical realism, right? Um, they're neutral on the question of an objective world, right? That's not interesting to them. That's that's episteme, right? Um, but what they are sure on is that knowledge is contextual, right? And that the knowledge that is created is always going to be contextual, will always be filtered through. What is the situation? Who are the people, right? Um, and I also think, I mean, I would have to dig very deep to be certain about that, but I think there's something about the kind of um, uh, generative causality that is the hallmark of realism, right? The process by which something happens that I think resonates with Frenesis's approach to, but how do we get the thing, how, how do we choose and make things happen in this context, right? I think those are, those are highly compatible uh, moments. So this is kind of where phrenesis is coming from as a thought process. And this kind of raises the question, right? Is phrenesis science, right? Well, no, it's, it's knowledge generating and it can be rigorous and it can meet those sorts of criteria, but it's, it's got a different purpose, right? The next thing is, does phrenesis belong within these social science paradigms we talk about? And so the reason I'm bringing this up is because Sanford Schramm straight up says it in his 2012 essay on this, right? Um, social science is now arguably increasingly non or post paradigmatic in the sense that the field is moving away from the idea that research should be according to one unifying methodology or distinctive logic or inquiry. You know, he wrote this in 2012. I'm recording this video in uh, 2021. I'm still talking about the paradigms and I will talk about the paradigms uh, for a long time to come, if not my entire academic career. Um, so what's up with that, right? And so the place where Shram and I agree, right? And I'm just going to say what comes after this is my interpretation of the current landscape in social science research, right? So. Uh, recognize that it's coming from a particular author and you can decide uh, how you feel about it and do your own research. Um, so where I agree with Shram is that I do think contemporary social science research is actually open to the fact that you, there isn't just one paradigm in which we work that is science, right? That is, that is right. There is not one single approach and that is the approach. And if you don't do that approach, you are bad and wrong and it's not good research, right? Um, the kind of compulsory unity of science approach taken by some positivists and that kicked off this debate coming from our friends King, Cohen and Verba. Um, I don't think that kind of dominance is present anymore. What I think is definitely 150% true is that work that is positivist and work that is interpretivist is different work, right? And I think uh, 
for those in my class, going back to um, Gertz and Mahoney's argument about cultures of social science research, right? These cultures remain distinct and asking questions is most fruitful when you're asking it from within the culture or paradigm that the work is coming from, right? Or when you understand, I have questions from a different paradigm, right? And you're, and you're coming at it from that different perspective. Um, and so, you know, you can work in whatever paradigm you want. And I believe that our, our disciplines and our practices basically have room for that. It's not to say you'll never get pushback from someone who really thinks their paradigm is correct and yours is stupid, but generally I think we have an attitude among the social sciences that's pretty big about this. Um, but I think it's still important to kind of understand thinking paradigmatically because at some point you're going to have to understand what your own assumptions about research are, right? And how that shapes what you did. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that SRAM's high-minded, we're done with paradigms, partially is based on an idea that phrenesis is now a universal role and it's not, right? Um, there are still plenty of researchers in the social sciences who do not believe they are producing uh, phrenesis, they believe they're producing episteme. First of all, there are plenty that don't know that distinction, right? Because that their education hasn't provided them with that. But and many do kind of think their research should have a social, a social purpose, right? They should be policy relevant is the language that is frequently used um, or that it should serve some social benefit. But the idea that the entire purpose of research is producing the knowledge that allows us to make judgments in those terms is not the way most researchers think about their work. I think it's a good way to think about your work I would encourage every researcher to carry at least a piece of that into their work. But fundamentally, if your goal is producing some different kind of knowledge, there are still plenty of social science researchers who are doing exactly that. 